Okay, so just before starting, I, I wanted to do a, a short uh, history of why people got interested into uh, random matrices. And uh, this goes back, oh, I forgot <laughs> how this uh, Boards are tough. So, so the story started with Vichart. So John Vichart. So in uh, about 1928. So he was a statistician, uh, but working uh, apparently in the Department of Agriculture. And uh, he was interested in trying to analyze uh, da data. And uh, so his question was the following. So imagine that you observe some vector x, x, so it would be n-dimensional, x1, xm. I don't know, you can imagine it can be some sort of disease in some species of uh, animals or whatever. And you observe it uh, several times, xm, all right? And you try to infer if there is correlation between what you observed. So for instance, if this kind of animals get this kind of disease, uh, more often will they get another one uh, that you are also measuring and so on and so forth. And so the way to do, to try to understand correlation is to look at the spectrum of the matrix. So you look at the matrix X, so big X, which will be X1, Xn. So it's a M by N matrix. And uh, what you see is that the dimensions or the correlation between uh, the data that you are measuring uh, can be uh, understood in the spectrum. So for instance, imagine that you can write X as lambda times U V transpose. So this means that this is lambda. And then you have VU1 uh, uh, UM uh, V. So V is going to be uh, M by M, uh, N by N. And so this means that you multiply just each vector in each row by one uh, coordinate of U1, and then UM. All right, so what you see then is that, so if you have this case, which corresponds to the fact that you have only one eigenvalue, which is non-zero, all uh, your observation will be proportionals. So they will be highly correlated, okay? And more generally, what you want to uh, understand is can you find a few eigenvalues which will be done zero, or which will be large and the other will be small, so that somehow you understand that the data will concentrate onto this vector space. So this will show that there are, this will allow you to, so imagine that in general you try to find R so that you can write something like this. and the, the rest is small. Okay, so then you will try to understand that the, d the data that you're observing, they're all living in the smaller subset. So there are correlations. Okay, so that's the idea. And in fact, so in general, considering eigenvalues of non-emission matrices is kind of complicated. So what you do is you look, consider what is called the covariance matrix. So it's x times it's transpose. But you can see that if uh, the fact that x has low dimension is equivalent to the fact that this guy has a small dimension, so in this case, so x, x transpose would just be lambda 2 u, u transpose. OK, so if in the case here, And so, so the question is, how can you uh, study the eigenvalues of this guy and find somehow how many eigenvalues big enough you have and what are the dimension of the data, okay? 
So more generally, find lambda i. plus something small. OK, and so these are the eigenvalues. So it's lambda i square eigenvalues of x, x star. So you see that somehow you want to understand this. What are the large eigenvalues of uh, this kind of covariance matrices? So the, and so, so far, there was absolutely no randomness. OK, so no, you have matrices. So these matrices can be large, because uh, you can imagine that you have many observations of a very big uh, data. So actually, uh, nowadays, the, uh, people are more and more considering uh, big sets of data. So you have this question with very large matrices. And so still, it's not random. But uh, you can uh, introduce randomness by saying, so what I'm trying to understand is the correlation of, uh, of the data. So I can try to understand what kind of eigenvalues I will have if uh, I, would, I would imagine that my entries are, for instance, independent. Okay, Because I would like, for instance, to to try to understand if my data is made of independent events. So, but then how should look the, the spectrum of a matrix where I have independent data? Right, so this was how, so if the spectrum, if the entries is independent, how should look the eigenvalues? Because then you can say, well, I observe this kind of, of eigenvalues. It really looks like something independent, or it doesn't. Or maybe I can retrieve the correlation between the data from uh, the observation of this. Uh, if I assume some kind of uh, form of the data, some kind of correlation. All right, so this was Vichart's uh, uh, question. And then, uh, actually, there was not much interest into random matrices uh, till the 50s. So it was in the 50s, it was Wigner. So in uh, 56, I think. So Wigner is a Nobel Prize uh, in physics. And he was interested in completely different kind of problem. And the type of problem he was interested in was the quantum mechanics of particles, and in particular of what is called heavy nucleus. And what uh, seemed to happen is that they were observing uh, this nucleus. And somehow the analysis they were trying to do, uh, based on previous um, uh, studies of, of simpler systems, was not at all uh, matching uh, the observations of this nucleus. So and somehow the, the analysis that they were doing was based on uh, a simpler, simple one kind of body interaction particle. And um, what Wigner said is that this this cannot explain uh, what we observe. And this is because what happens in this nucleus is very complicated. You have lots of uh, particles. And uh, somehow, what, uh, we, we cannot approximate that by simpler system. But what we can do is try to uh, model this, uh, this physical system by something very random. Okay, And the idea is, what he said is that, Let's model uh, our system by something as random as possible within what we know. Okay, so often, very often, randomness is used to model what we don't know. Okay, that's a general principle that uh, random variables uh, just hide uh, somehow what uh, everything we don't know on a model. Okay, it's kind of the uncertainty. 
So here it was the same thing. So Wigner said, well, in quantum mechanics, everything is described by what is called the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is something which is an operator. And it's complicated. But you can imagine that uh, you can eventually approximate it by a matrix. So approximate by a matrix. So you have to imagine that the Hamiltonian is usually uh, acting on the continuous space. But here, you can approximate it by a discrete, uh, discrete thing, by approximating by a matrix. And then the idea is, so this matrix has to be large, because it's approximating uh, an Hamiltonian. And then the idea is to try to model this matrix in a random fashion within everything you know about this matrix. Okay. So for instance, what he said is that for some system, uh, what I know is that so this should be uh, self-adjoint. OK, so what this means is that so this is a matrix h i j, i j in between 1 and n. And you know that h i j is so the conjugate of x j i. So sometimes the entries are just real in which case you can forget this conjugate. And if they are complex, so this is just a complex conjugate. All right, so, and maybe actually we don't know anything more about this matrix. So what then you, uh, Wigner will say is that let's choose these entries independent. Choose entries independently. And they can be like Gaussian. So I think it was taking Gaussian variables, independent. And just you have the symmetric constraint. And then, so the idea is just, so now the spectrum of this matrix is going to be important because in quantum mechanics, uh, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian represent the energies of the system. So this is the thing you can measure. And uh, so the idea, th so let's try this model. We look at the eigenvalues, and we try to compare with what uh, we can see in the experiments. And then this will uh, allow us to say whether the, the model is fine or not. And it turned out that uh, this uh, model worked for uh, some examples. And then the what's, what another physicist said, so Dyson, what Dyson said was that, well, if ever anyway your model is not working, so the observation of the eigenvalues is not giving you what uh, you want, it's maybe that there is something that uh, you didn't know, and uh, some symmetry or some relation between the entries that you didn't know, and you have to try to find it. And you try to uh, change your model until somehow your uh, observation will match the results given by the, the matrices. OK, so in both cases, what you can see is that random matrices appear like a big, complex array of data. Uh, randomness is coming, in both cases, from the fact that we ignore um, more precise information on the model. So we try to model it by random things within everything we know. Okay, and then we try to match it with observation. OK, and then, so in both cases, the question is, so how can we understand the spectrum of matrices when they have very big size? OK, so, and so this is uh, the subject how to study the spectrum. of matrices random with size going to infinity. And it's not an easy question, because if you think about it, 
uh, if you are given a model, let's say you have a matrix which is a mission uh, with independent entries, so the spectrum is not an easy function of the entries. So how, how can you uh, solve this question? And actually, so it's, it took quite a long time to uh, analyze this question. So now, in the last 10 or 20 years, there was lots of progress in the understanding of the spectrum of this uh, type of matrices that I'm going to describe. Uh, but we will see that there are really uh, different kind of questions. So the question that I will uh, address is about the macroscopic kind of properties of the spectrum. And what Catri Catherine will consider is more what I would call a microscopic. Right, so. so analyze microscopic properties. So namely, what I want to say with that is that I would like to know that, like, the collective behavior. So for instance, if I look at some interval A, B in R, can I compute the number of eigenvalues which will fall in this interval? Okay, and here A and B will be of size one. Okay, uh, can I say, uh, can I say like, uh, can I study the fluctuations? So fluctuations of this guy. So this is macroscopic because you just try to understand the common behavior. And what Catherine will consider is a question of uh, which is more local, which is, for instance, let's look at the largest eigenvalue. So we're only one. So it's that's why I call it microscopic because. You look at only one, so you really zoom on one eigenvalue. And what is the behavior? So similar question would be if you look at two nearest eigenvalues, how, how far are they? What is the gap between two eigenvalues? So this would be also microscopic. All right. Questions? So, I think that Alisa introduced yesterday uh, one, uh, one of the central results about this microscopic uh, analysis. And the central result is to show what is called Wigner's theorem. So it was actually proved by Wigner in, in, the, in the 50s. So Wigner's theorem, Wigner considered matrices, as I said, which are so n by n, which are emission. So it's n by n matrix. Then you have to specify a bit more about the model. So, so what is specified was that the expectation of xij is 0. So this is not really important, but if you want to have a well-defined limit, you should also specify so the covariance. Let me say that this is 1. And uh, so for Wigner's theorem, you have a technical condition, which is that for all ij, you have all moments. Okay. 
So, okay, so this means that this is integrable on all LP. So you're assuming here that there's some underlying measure space where we think there's sort of random that depends on, on points in that measure space. Is that, is that right? When you say it's a random variable, you don't sort of specify what so, it varies, right? You just think it's underlying. So, so I have a collection of random variables right. here. And so they will be independent. So, so what I can say that, so let me write it like this. So the, if I look at the fact that xij belongs to some set, so let's say aij, and I look at the intersection. So I, I take i smaller or equal to j because of the symmetry. So this should be just a product measure. So this is independent. And uh, I specify some properties on the other. So, so this should be, let's say, I call it mu. So I will assume for simplicity that outside of the diagonal, they all have the same law. Okay. And on the diagonal, maybe because if this is complex, I want to have real entries on the diagonal. So I take another probability measure. So this gives, this defines for me. Yeah. I will put it afterwards. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, there will be the square root of n, don't worry. <laughs> I mean, that's always a question whether you renormalize your law at this point or after you, you just renormalize the lambda i. That's, uh, that's about the same. So the, the question of Alisa is that if you look at, again, at matrices like this, they will have very big eigenvalues. It will be of order square root of n. And so uh, we need to divide the, the, these eigenvalues by square root of n to make sense of a limit like this if A and B of order, of order 1. So I could also have here decided that the covariance is 1 over N um, and do something like this, but I think it's clearer to, to put the normalization afterwards. Okay, so here, so here this defines a joint law for the eigenvalues of my matrix. And so this property is that so the integral of x d mu x is 0. The integral of x squared d mu x is 1. And you have all moments which are finite. And the same for nu. OK. And now I put all this a random variable into my big matrix. Is it clear? Yeah? Why are there two? Why is there new and new? So that's, um, OK. So maybe I should have just done the real case. But so I I in the case where uh, you have complex entries, so if you want this property to be verified, so you see that if i is equal to j, this implies that you should have a real entries on the diagonal. So in this case, you have to choose probability measure mu on the diagonal, uh, and uh, which is uh, on the real line, and uh, um, a probability measure event eventually on the complex plane, uh, mu outside the diagonal. So that's why usually, and in fact, so if you look uh, later at the proof, I, I don't really need to take all of them equal. If I would have these two properties, and they would be chosen to hold uniformly on ij, I w here, these bonds would be uniform, then I would get the same limit. OK, so in fact, the, the asymptotic, so that's a big uh, point in random uh, matrices, is that many properties of the spectrum are, are universal in the sense that they do not depend on the precise definition of the matrix. So here it's the case. I, I give you as an idea that here you have the same probability measures, but in fact, you only really need that. And in fact, you need even less. I mean, 
we, we could also suppress this, and we could also suppress that in some cases. So, so in fact, to get the same uh, limit for uh, this kind of uh, a number of eigenvalues in a, uh, in a set, uh, you need very little. But you, ne you need to have enough integrability. You need to have a finite covariance. This is very important. So then, so what uh, Wigner is saying so what Wigner is saying is that so if you look at the number of eigenvalues, so here I normalize by i, so I fix a and b. Uh, in R, so the eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices are always real. So I know that it makes sense to look at them only on the real line. So if I normalize this, so what he says is that this converges as n goes to infinity towards so the measure, the semicircular measure of A B. Where a b, where sigma is one of x smaller or equal to four, I didn't say yet in which sense. Uh, times four minus x square, the x divided by uh, two pi. So here the convergence. So you have to think that this is a random quantity. And the convergence holds in many ways. So it holds so in expectation. So this means that if we take the expectation here, we will have convergence. It holds also in probability. So this means that the probability that this is far from this, this is at some distance from this, is going to 0 when n goes to infinity. So we will see these two, uh, these two things. And it holds also what we call almost surely. So this means on a set with probability 1. Oops, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking, I don't remember if it's 1 over pi or 1 over 2 pi. That's terrible. And then I got confused about the four, <laughs> I think. Yeah. OK, so, so this, is, um, this is Wigner's theorem, which tells you somehow how the eigenvalues are uh, distributed. And so what I would like to do uh, now is to prove uh, this uh, theorem when you take convergence in expectation. Is there any question before I start to give you the argument how to prove that? Uh, yeah, so, I, okay, so, so what I will prove now, so the convergence in expectation means that so if you take the expectation, so this means the integral under your law, the number of eigenvalues, so this is just, so this is just some, uh, some random variable with values in 0, 1, because you have at most n variable. So the expectation of this converges as n goes to infinity towards, so sigma of a, b which is the integral over a b of the square root minus 2, 2 of 4 minus x square dx, so let's say over 2 pi. OK, so this means, oops, I, for, I forget the, yeah, 
So that's the trick. When you don't normalize at the beginning, you are likely to forget the one over square root uh, on the way. OK. So this is. Uh, so this is uh, the first theorem, which was uh, really proven as a matter of convergence in random matrices. And so the way that actually Vigneur proved it, and this is also the way that we will follow, is uh, by computing moments. So the idea, and so we will think that Alisa will discuss that, otherwise I, I will do it uh, next time. So. The idea is that if you want to, to get convergence, so you can think that this is a special case of another convergence, which is that if you take f, let's say, bonded continuous, so then So you could ask whether, if you take f a bonded continuous function, this is going to converge to the integral of f of x sigma dx. OK, so the relation between these two things is just you take f of x, which is 1 of x in a, b. Right? So this is not bonded continuous. But the idea is that somehow, because uh, bonded continuous function, or you can approximate this function by nice sequences of bonded continuous function. In fact, if you can prove this for all a, b, or this for all bonded continuous function, this will be the same. OK, so we will detail that uh, in further discussion, if you want. And then. And then you can go even uh, farther in this kind of reasoning and think, well, you, you just need to prove this kind of convergence for sufficiently many functions, f. And in fact, what is pretty uh, useful in random matrix theory is to prove it for what is called moments. OK, so you take functions which are not anymore bonded. But there are moments. And you want to prove this as n goes to infinity for all k. So again, you have apparently changed a bit the problem on the way. But you see, you, you go from uh, a function which is just yeah. 1 and 0. So then you go to, towards some kind of smooth functions. And then, so I don't know how to draw xk. <laughs> so it's kind of uh, yeah, some kind of thing like this when k is even. And the point is, again, that this will be enough to prove this convergence for these uh, moments. Uh, because if you you can then get the convergence for all polynomial functions, and you can approximate any function uh, f which is continuous by polynomial functions, and then you can go to this kind of uh, uh, step functions. So. Uh, so th this is supposed to be a representation. So this is one. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just a step function. So this is this case. Then you kind of modify it. So you could imagine you can approximate uh, any function like this. So and then you can. So there is some lines of mathematics to write. But I think you can at least understand the idea now. And we can detail that uh, maybe in the exercise session. So, so then you can uh, modify it to get continuous function. And then, uh, because polynomials uh, 
can be used to approximate continuous function on compacts, uh, then this is enough to prove that. And this is uh, actually what uh, Wigner proved. So how are you going to prove that? Because, of course, wh why do you want to change all this into this question? The point is that your hypothesis concerns the entries of the matrix. So you want somehow to express things at some point in terms of the entries of the matrix. And then, so there is this nice uh, result of spectral theory, which is that so the trace of a matrix XK is just the sum of the eigenvalues to the K. OK. Here the trace. So the trace of a matrix A is just the sum of a, its diagonal elements. And so this is a, a use of uh, the spectral theorem that uh, Aditha uh, showed yesterday. All right, so and why, yes, why are you happy? It's that x to the k, you know how to compute the entries of x to the k in terms of the entries of x. So a, k, so if I look at the entry ij of a to the k, so it's just going to be the sum of uh, a i i1, a i k j, uh, minus 1, where you sum over i1, i k minus 1, from 1 to n. So this is a formula for computing moments of matrices. OK, so if you look at these two things, so this quantity I am trying to estimate. So what I was trying to estimate, lambda i to the k. So I can write it as, oops, sorry, I forgot the square root of l. I think Alisa was right. Should have in included at the beginning. OK, so then this is just 1 over n. So I can put the square root of n uh, outside. So it's 1 plus k over 2. Then the trace of x to the k. And now I can write everything in terms of the entries. So I just write the trace on the moment formula. So it's sum over i1, ik, x i1, i2 x, i2, i3. I continue until x, i, k, i1. So here is a trick. By looking at moments, you could express everything in terms of the entries. And now you, you know the law of these joint entries. So you have some hope to uh, estimate this moment. All right. And so actually, we are not going to prove this uh, directly. What we are going to prove is that this converge towards some numbers that Alisa described yesterday, which are the Catalan numbers, by exactly l using this formula. So the statement, the Wigner theorem, is that for all k, so the expectation of 1 over n, the sum of lambda i over square root n to the k. So this converges towards, so 0 if k is odd. OK, so 
This means somehow you can think, in fact, the, the point is that the lambda i, they allow you expect them to go towards some symmetric measure around the origin, so you expect one moment to vanish. And otherwise, ck over 2, where ck is a Catalan number. So the Catalan numbers were introduced by Alisa uh, yesterday. So CK. It's 2k factorial about divided by k factorial, k plus 1 factorial. So what Alisa will show is that this is, in fact, so if you take this semicircular law, this is, in fact, this moment, x2k of the semicircular law. So she, sh she will sh show that today. Uh, but in fact, these Catalan numbers have many other descri uh, descriptions. They appear a lot in combinatorial problems. And the way we will see them uh, showing up is uh, by the fact that they count trees. So I will explain what this means. So there are a certain number of combinatorial objects. So there are the number of rooted trees with k edges. But I should specify something. So I will specify actually everything, but with k edges which are embedded into the plan. Embedded, or you can think drawn. So, so what is what does this mean? So a tree, a tree, or maybe I should start by defining graph. So a graph is just a set of vertices and edges. So V is like I1, IK. And the edges is a collection of i, g, k, i, g, l for some choices of these indices. OK, so namely. <laughs> What you have with so you are given points. So these are I one, I two, I three, I four, let's say I five. And you decide that you are going to put some edge in between some vertices. So this will be your collections. So something, for instance, like this. OK, so it's a, a graph is connected So if you have a pass from any point to any other inside the, gray, the, the edges, so for all i, j in v, there exists I1, IK, so that I equal I1, I2, IK equal to J, where IL, IL plus 1 is an H. So this forbid, for instance, to have suddenly 
two vertices like this and an edge over there. And so it is a tree if, um, so there is no cycle, it's a connected graph with no cycle. So a cycle is if you can go from uh, one point to itself by taking uh, edges in the graph which are different. So a cycle is, so if you have a path Uh, so that uh, ij, ij plus 1 are, dif are in E, are different. Okay, so typically in this example, I don't have a cycle because I can never come back. But if I would have this extra edge, I could take this series of points and get a cycle. Okay, so now the question is how uh, are we going to count the trees? Because of course there are lots of symmetries that you can uh, think about. And uh, the way that uh, we're going to count the trees is first we're going to give them a root. So this is a favorite a distinguished edge. So for instance this one where it's oriented. And then the other thing that we want to do is uh, to specify how we count symmetries. So for instance, what I want to say is that, so imagine I have this tree. Will I count this tree and this tree to be the same or will they be different? Okay, so imagine I have a root. So, and what I want to say, I want to say that this is not the same. So I don't count the, uh, I, I count the, the symmetries of this rotation. And I do that by things that it is embedded into the plane. So this means that I specify the way I actually draw it in the plane. So this is equivalent. So this means that somehow the plane has some orientation. And I can give myself uh, an exploration pass onto this tree, OK? Well, I will follow the orientation of the plan. And I will just start from the root. And I will explore my, uh, my tree following this exploration pass, OK? So the, this is equivalent to, be, to say that I am given an exploration pass on the tree. And this exploration pass, so it's a, it's a pass which starts from the root. And it will cover, so I2, and then I have H, so G1, and so on. And then I return to the root. So it's a pass. So when I sp speak about a pass, it's always that each step is an edge of the graph. OK. And so this exploration pass will have uh, two k steps. And we'll visit all vertices. And we'll return to the to the to the, uh, the first point, and so we'll gi we gives me a unique embedding into the plan. So somehow, what I'm when I'm counting the trees, I am counting in fact the number of of trees and the number of exploration paths of these trees. Okay. So <coughs> so now the question is. Uh, how to relate uh, our, uh, of course I, I erased it, but how to relate our quantities 
with the Catalan numbers. So, so remember that so what we want to consider is this guy. And I want to show that this guy is going to converge to this Catalan number. So this, this enumeration problems of enumerating these trees. And so what my main tool is going to be this spectral formula that we just described, which is 1 over n plus so k over 2 coming from here, and the sum over x i1 i2 x i k i1. All right. So the idea here is that somehow if you want to look, so you can expand that. So you can take the expectation inside. And then you have the expectation of x i1 i2 x i k i1. So this is what I will denote ti1 ik. So the idea is that I want to estimate that. And I know that all these guys are bounded, okay? because I know that my entries are in LP. So they're all finite by some constant independent on n. And so what I want to understand is the main contribution of this quantity. And so what you see that you have to understand what are the indices so that this guy is non-zero, and what is the main contribution? So what are the indices or the indices which will contribute to the leading order? And so how can we uh, get uh, some kind of idea of graphs here? Well, the idea is that you can associate to i1, ik, so these indices, you can associate a graph, g. So let me call this i. So a graph g which show is given by a, a set of vertices and a set of edges. So what are, are, are the vi? So the vi are just this set of points, uh, where here, when you have two i's which are equal, you just merge these points. They're just equal, where e are edges which are equal or merge. And then you have a set of edges, which is just i1, i2, ik, i1. OK, so, so being given your indices, you can just So for instance, so let's see i1 is equal to 1, i2 is equal to 2, i3 is equal to 1, I don't know, i4 is equal to, uh, to 3. So let's say something like this. So I start from i1, then I go to i2, which is different from i1. So I have this edge, i1, i2. Then I go to i3. OK, so this is i3, which is equal. Then I go to I4, which is something different. And then I go back to I1. Okay, so in this case, 
I have, uh, I have three different vertices and four edges because I have degree four. Okay, so what we will see tomorrow is that for the main contribution, so if you want T I I1, IK uh, to be non-zero, then the main contribution, the main contribution is such that for this graph, for GI, so you can think about uh, is a tree, and E defines an exploration pass. Uh, so it's a rooted tree. Well, E defines an exploration pass on the tree. Okay, so the idea is that somehow trees are the graphs which allow to have the most different indices because somehow the main contribution will come when you have the m as many i's which are different because the, the indices varies from 1 to n. So you want the main contribution will be given by the indices where you can choose as many indices different as possible. Because this has to be non-zero, we will see that this, we cannot take, t, t cannot be non-zero, for instance, when all the indices are different. When all indices are different, the, this will be zero. But we will see that somehow the most number, the biggest number of indices that we can have which are different is one plus k over two. And then these indices have to be given by this uh, structure of uh, embedded trees. And this will allow us to get the convergence of the moments. So I will do that tomorrow. And do you have any questions? No? <laughs> okay, so, so I will go into the uh, how to do this analysis tomorrow, and then uh, we will uh, um, investigate uh, central limit theorems, which are always kind of, so how do you fluctuate around these uh, kind of limits? And we will see some generalization. So that's the plan of, of my course. And this will all use uh, this kind of ideas that when you compute moments, somehow uh, moments are going to be given by numbers, a bit like uh, moments of Gaussian are given in terms of uh, non-crossing partitions. Moments of uh, eigenvalues are going to be given by uh, some kind of uh, n number of, of graphs. And this, uh, this generalized to many uh, other settings. So that's the idea that somehow to, to, uh, to estimate this kind, of, uh, this kind of properties of the matrices, you can express everything into combinatorial problems by going through this kind of formulas, and by looking at the main uh, contribution of indices. OK, so if there is no question, thank you for your attention, and see you tomorrow. <laughs>